And uh, but let's go back to First Thessalonians, chapter number. Uh, well, actually, chapter number one, we looked at uh, that one verse concerning the wrath of God. Really, uh, let, let's read real quickly chapter two and three, the, the the mentionings of the coming of Christ. I'm not going to deal with these two tonight because they are so related to the phrase day of Christ that we're going to look at in 2 Thessalonians 2. When we get to 2 Thessalonians 2, we're going to come back and grab the verses in chapter 2 and chapter 3. But we'll, but we'll look at them real quickly. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So he say, you that that uh, the Lord has allowed me to win to the Lord. You are my hope. You're my joy. You're my crown of rejoicing uh, at the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, then uh, verse number 12 of chapter 3, And the Lord make you to increase uh, and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness, before God, even, the, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And I do believe that is the rapture of the church when he comes with... And when it's, don't, don't let all the word all uh, mess with you there because what he's speaking of here is all the saints that are in heaven. And we know this because of what he says in chapter 4, that all the saints that are with Christ, he's going to bring with him at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's when, he says, to the end he may establish, may establish your hearts unblameable and holiness before God at the coming. And that's, he's talking about the believer. And so my heart is unblameable in holiness before God at the coming. So that would be for me and you at the rapture of the church when he comes with all his saints that are in heaven. Let's go to chapter 4, and uh, we'll, look, we'll look at those verses in chapter 2 and 3, uh, possibly uh, two or three sessions down the road at least, uh, maybe, maybe the next one, I'm not sure. But to go to 1 Thessalonians 4, and we're going to look at the, the most prominent rapture passage uh, in the New Testament. Uh, look at verse number 13. And some of these aspects are just pretty self-explanatory. He's just talking about and explains some things concerning the second coming of Christ. He says in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And Paul says that a few times in the New Testament. I would not have you be ignorant. In other words, I don't want you to be stupid about this. I want you to have some smarts about this. Uh, don't want you to be ignorant about any of these issues. And one of those issues is the rapture of the church. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And that's someone who's dead in Christ, a saint who has gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, they're in heaven alive and well, but their body is laying there as if it's asleep. And so that's the, uh, the uh, comparison that Paul is making. He says, that you sorrow not, and I'm glad he didn't put a period there. He put a comma. Well, Paul didn't, but uh, the translators had to to, make it, to help it make sense. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He doesn't say sorrow not, period. He says sorrow not as those who have no hope. You're going to sorrow in this life. The Bible teaches that you will. We will sorrow, and it is a very painful thing to lose a loved one. But, um, but uh, even when I followed my grandpa's casket and then later my daddy's casket to the grave. I didn't sorrow like someone that uh, is of this world. Uh, someone of this world who lost a loved one, that loved one is in hell or at least if the person is in heaven, the one left behind is going to hell. That person has no hope and no hope to see them. I didn't sorrow like that. Uh, the, uh, someone who is lost has no hope but a saved person has hope. And if your loved one is saved and you have even extra hope in that you're going to see them again. And so you will sorrow. It causes much pain, but, but, but not like someone who will never see them again. Now, verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, and here it is, will God bring with him. That's what, he's talk, that's what he was talking about in chapter 3. 
Verse 13, when he says, come with all his saints, well, here, that's what he's talking about. When Jesus comes, he's bringing all his saints with him, and those who are here on the earth, the saints on the earth, will meet him in the air. There's a lot of people that try to take chapter 3 and verse 13 and try to make that the post-tribulational coming. And, and technically speaking, there will be all the saints coming with him uh, to an extent then, but uh, from, as far as the church saints, but that's still not going to be all the saints. There's still going to be some here on the earth. Especially, you know, the Israelites are going to be saints at the time, and they're going to be here on the earth when Christ comes and saves that nation. So even then, it's not technically every saint that is in existence. And so let's not overdo the word all here. He's just talking about all the saints that are in heaven, and then when Christ comes, he's bringing all of them with him, and we're going to be called up to meet them in the air with the Lord. Okay, well, let's uh, move on. And verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, and that word prevent is an old English word for proceed. We will not go before them which are asleep. They get to go first, as, as they should. They, they face death. Uh, they face the most terrifying thing that a human being could, could, could face, death. And so... They went home to be with the Lord. They went through death in faith, trusting their soul to the eternal Savior, and they went into eternity, and so they should have the privilege of coming up first uh, before us. Uh, but we're not going to prevent, we're not going to precede them. But notice it says, we which are alive and remain. Now here's the words that I believe my pastor used to say, I believe the rapture is going to be a rescue operation. Because why didn't he just say alive? You know what I'm saying? Why didn't he just say we which are alive under the coming of the Lord? No, he says we which are alive and remain. As if, as if a whole lot of people may have been persecuted and taken out. You, you, you understand the, 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 the possibility of that interpretation here. But he says which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. I'm not saying that's exactly what that means, but that is, that is a possibility of what that, that means. Uh, he could just be saying, just, just using the phrase alive and you're here. And he just, it could have been a nonchalant thing, but, uh, but I really believe every word means something. And there could be that we are under heavy persecution when the rapture takes place. And so it may very well be a rescue operation, but the dead in Christ are going to rise first. He mentions that in verse 15, not that phrase, but the fact that we want, will not prevent them which are asleep. But he does say that in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, so a lot of wonderful things are happening here. The Lord himself comes down from heaven. For chapter number uh, 1, uh, verse number 10 says they're waiting for his son from heaven. So Jesus is in heaven. We're waiting on, on him to come. Well, here he comes. He's coming from heaven. He's descending from heaven. He's descending with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. A lot of noise is taking place here. Uh, there's, you know, there, there's been taught down through the ages uh, what would be called and termed a secret rapture. Uh, I, I, I don't know about that. I, I don't, I've never taught that, uh, the secret rapture. I've heard that term a lot. First there's the secret rapture, then there's the public coming of Christ at the end. I, I, don't know, I don't know that the rapture is going to be that secret. I mean, if you just read the verse, it sounds like it's a pretty noisy occasion. you got the Lord shouting, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God blowing. That sounds like a whole lot of racket. Now, I don't know that the world is going to recognize what's happening. I don't know that they're going to discern uh, what's taking place. Uh, so in that sense, maybe we can call it uh, secret. But there is a great possibility this world's going to hit. What in the world is all that racket? Uh, when in reality, it's the rapture. It's the, it's the catching away of the church. But here you have Lord coming down, voice of the archangel, uh, trump of God is blowing. The dead in Christ rise first, as we stated. Then, after they rise first, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Caught up simultaneously. So at one time, we are all caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And never again will there be a separation between us and the Lord. We'll always be with him. And so wherefore, comfort one another with these words because it's a comfort to know that you're going to see your, your loved ones who have gone on before you. You'll see them again. And what a comfort it is to know that you're going to be with the Lord forever, forever. So here's this beautiful uh, uh, theological teaching here of the rapture of the church. The Lord comes down. You have the archangel. You have the trump of God, the dead in Christ. We're caught up together. That there, there is a unity there. There's a oneness there. Called up together. Not called up one by one, but called up together together. Do y'all see that? There's no indication here that uh, God's going to get Sam, and he's going to reach over and get with Austin, he's going to reach over and get Alan, and th there's no, no, it's, it's, if he comes today, it's, we're all going at the same exact time. That, that's how that reads to me. Is that how that reads to you? That's very important, because I'm going to talk about that uh, here in just a minute. Th it's very important that we see that this is uh, all of us going at the same time, called up together. Now, here's the question. You pre rathians post-tribulationist, probably a mid-tribulationist, they all believe that this happens, the pre rathians believe it happens toward the end of the tribulation period. The post-tribulationists believe this happens at the very end of the tribulation period. In fact, they believe that this is the same event that we read about in Matthew 24, verse 31. In fact, take your Bible, go to Matthew 24, please. Matthew 24, I'm going to try to get done. If we go a little past 830, I, I, please forgive me, but I want to get this part in, then we'll be done. I went a little longer on the first session uh, than I wanted to, uh, but uh, just please bear with me. If you need to leave, get back up. We won't, uh, we won't throw too many rocks at you. Matthew 24, look at uh, verse number 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, all right, enter the post-tribulationist. This is, this is my rapture right here, the post-trib says. Even the pre-Rathian says this. See, the pre-Rathian doesn't believe that the tribulation of those days is the entire last half of the church period. They believe it's a brief time somewhere in the middle of that second part of the tribulation period. Uh, and, uh, and then somewhere in the middle of that last three and a half years, the rapture will take place. The post-tribulation sees the tribulation these days as all seven years, and, and so he sees this at the end of the seven years. So... Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. This, this is going to sound like Revelation 6 and that sixth seal. The sun's going to be darkened. The moon shall not give a light. The stars fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens be shaken. We read that in Revelation 6, the sixth seal. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. They believe that pre rathians and post-tribulationists and others believe that this is the same exact event, event as 1 Thessalonians 4 that we read a minute ago. Now, if they are correct, if this is the same exact event, then... One of them groups is right, and we just got to figure out, is it pre-wrath or is it post-trib? Somebody's right, and we're wrong. If this is the rapture of the church, I'm wrong, and I can't be a pre-trib, okay? If this is the same as that event. And there are similarities. There are similarities. You've got Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven, verse number 30. Well, that sounds like First Thessalonians 4, coming in the clouds. You got in verse 31, it says, and he sends his angels. Well, you don't see angels plural in 1 Thessalonians 4, but you do see an angel. You see the archangel. So that's, that's a similarity. Uh, with a great sound of a trumpet, verse 31. Well, you don't, you know, I think 1 Corinthians 15 says last trump. 1 Thessalonians says, you know, trumpet. Trumpets are involved, both of these. So that's a similarity. Um, they shall gather together his elect. First Thessalonians 4, so we'll be called up together. So you can see the similarities. Everybody see the similarities? Just look at these similarities. You, you start scratching your head. So wait a, wait a minute, that looks like the same thing. And he says he's going to gather his elect. Well, I'm, a, I'm elect. The Bible says in the New Testament, I'm elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. My goodness, there's Christians all over this planet. This must be our rapture. It looks like it's so similar to... 
1 Thessalonians 4, it must be the same thing. And that's as far as they go. They're done. They're done. It's the same thing. And they stop right there. And if I stopped right there, I would probably agree with them and be a post-trib or a pre-Rathian if I stopped right there. But they only note the similarities. And by the way, similarities are extremely important. Similarities is where you start. When you make your comparisons, you start with the similarities. If the sim okay, I see similarities here. But you don't stop there. Now you have to see, are there any differences? Are there any differences? Now, if these two things are, this event here in Matthew 24, in 1 Thessalonians 4, excuse me, Matthew 24, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4, a lot of numbers. Uh, if these two things are the same, then there'll be no differences. But if we see any differences, they may be similar, but they're different. What's the old saying? Things that are different are not the same. All right? Uh, I've used this illustration before. Let me use it again. If my sister-in-law, Kim, come walking in the door, some of you have... Uh, Brother Price, have you ever met my sister-in-law, Kim, Kelly's sister, Kim? Have you ever seen her, met her? Okay. I promise you. If she walked through that door, I would not have to... I may have to tell you her name eventually, but when she walked in, I would not have to tell you that's Kelly's sister. As soon as she walked through the door, you'll say, that's got to be Kelly's sister. You know why? Because they're so similar. They look like sisters. They're so... I would not... I will have to introduce you to her and tell you her name, but you would know immediately that's, that's my sister-in-law because of the similarities. But you wouldn't look at her and say, hey, there's Kelly. You know why? Because of the differences. I know it's another person because of the differences. What pre-trib, excuse me, pre-Rathians and post-tribs do, they look at the similarities and refuse to look at the differences. When you look at the differences, then you start to say, okay, this might not be the same thing as the rapture of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let, let's, let's look at a few of these differences. I'm trying to get through this. Let's start and look at verse 31 here. And he, Jesus, shall send his angels. So here's Jesus sending his angels to get whoever this is, this elect. He's sending his angels to gather them. Go to John chapter 14, please. John chapter 14. I also think it's very interesting that what Jesus says in John chapter 14, what we're going to read in just a minute, nowhere is it recorded in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But you know that John, nowhere in the Gospel of John does he talk about the tribulation period? But Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about the tribulation period. Mark 20, excuse me, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, tribulation period. But none of them mention these words. But John mentions these words and never mentions the Olivet Discourse, the tribulation period. Look at these words, John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Boy, doesn't that sound a whole lot more personal than uh, Matthew 24, verse 31? Matthew 31, angels, go get them. John 14, I'll take care of business. I'll go get them. See that? He says, I will come. He doesn't send anybody in John 14. He comes himself. In fact, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 4. The word himself. And it's almost as if the Apostle Paul knew that one of these days there's going to be somebody who believes in a post-trib or pre-rapture. So we better make this thing really clear. 1 Thessalonians 4 Look at verse number 16. For the Lord, what's the next word? Himself. Himself. And the Bible says that we meet the Lord in the air. There is no sending of anybody. Now there is an archangel there, and there's a trump of God there, 
But it's as if the Apostle Paul or the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is trying to get it into our heads. It's the Lord himself. This is John 14 language here in 1 Thessalonians 4. I'm going to, come, I'm going to go prepare a place and I'm coming to get you himself. He's not sending anybody for us. You know, when I got married, I didn't send somebody to Thompson, Georgia to pick her up and bring her up here. I went and got her. I didn't, I didn't send a bunch of my friends. Hey, Chris, uh, Brent, Chris, brother Shane, Shane, y'all go, go down there and grab Kelly for me. Bring her up here. I didn't do that. I went myself. And that's what Jesus is going to do with his bride. He's coming to get her for himself. Okay? Difference number one. Go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. If y'all listen fast, I'll try my best to teach fast. If y'all don't, then it's going to take us a while, okay? We're going to blame you. All right. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Somebody tell me. How many sounds? Count the sounds of the trumpets in this verse. Somebody count them for me. One. One. So how many sounds? One big sound. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. Verse number 51. First Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the what? The last trump. A trump is not just the president. It is also the sound of a trumpet. That's what a trump is. It's the sound of a trumpet. Okay? At the last trump. At the last, not at the last trumpet. At the last sounding of the trumpet. Meaning there are multiple sounds and that the last one. In other words, when the rapture takes place, you and I are going to hear multiple sounds of a trumpet. And at the last one, we're going to be taken out. In Revelation, excuse me, Matthew 24, verse 31, one sound. One sound. Uh, you say, well, where in the Bible? There's multiple places we can go to. Uh, to try to find out what, about multiple trumpets. I've heard those who went to numbers and talk about the two trumpets and the assemblies and the got calling the armies together, things like that. I like Joshua. Joshua chapter 5. Uh, the Bible says that they blew the trumpet how many times? Seven times. The first ones were quick. That seventh one was long. You know what the Bible says? That ha the, you know what happened? When they blew that, 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 that trumpet the seventh time, the Bible says they ascended up into the, they shouted, they shouted, and ascended up into the city. They went up into the city. And they shouted. Well, the Bible says that there's going to be a shout when the Lord returns, and we're going up to the city. So could it be Joshua 5 and 6 is a picture of the rapture of the church? A quick seven blowings of the trumpet, that last trump, lay down at the last trump, we go up into the city. That's an interesting thought. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but unless you fuss at me, then I might be. But when this takes place in Matthew 24, it's one sound. In fact, go to Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27. Verse 12. Y'all there? Look at verse 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat all from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and he shall be gathered one by one. Thank you, son. One by one. O ye children of Israel. So who are we talking about here? Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown. And they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and to the outcast in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Israel is going to be, going to be gathered together. And he says here, 
when the great trumpet shall be blown. This is Israel's gathering. That sounds like Matthew 24, 31, doesn't it? When Israel's gathering. Is that what that sounds like to you? It does to me. Go back to Matthew uh, 24 real quickly. Uh, we're not done. I, I could probably spend a little more time on that one, but uh, we need to move on, and I'll touch a few things related to that as we go. Matthew 24, uh, verse 31 again. He shall send his angels with the sound of a trumpet, great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect, gather together his elect. Gather together. Now, here's, here's one of the difficulties. You've got verses like 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, where it talks about the coming together, excuse me, the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him. That's a similarity. The gathering together unto the Lord, and here's a gathered, gathering together unto Christ. And so they see that similarity uh, because of the, of the words that are used. But could there be a difference? It says... They, they shall gather together his elect. Go to Isaiah, please. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. And look at verse number 4. Isaiah 45 and verse number 4. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. Now, all this is talking about uh, Cyrus, the king. I'm not going to get into all that. But here in Isaiah 45, verse 4, he calls Israel his elect. The word elect is only used two other times in the Old Testament. In fact, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Isaiah 65, 9. Both of these are in Isaiah 65, by the way. Isaiah 65, verse 9. And verse 22, Isaiah 65, verses 9 and 22. Only other places after Isaiah 45 that you find the word elect. So in Isaiah 45, Israel, mine elect. And when you go home and you read Isaiah 65, 9 and 22, you're going to see Israel again in those verses. The next time, the very next time you see the word elect used in the Bible, so if, if the last time you heard the identity of the elect was Israel, Isaiah 45, and you keep reading your Bible, the next time you run into the word elect is in Matthew 24. It's not used anywhere to, between Isaiah and Matthew 24. The next time you see it is Matthew 24. So if the last time I read elect, he's talking about Israel, who do I think he's still talking about when I get to Matthew 24? It's going to be Israel. It's going to be Israel. Now, that's not my most important thought uh, because we're called the elect too, and that's what the post-tribs and pre-rathians say. Well, we're, we're elect. I, I understand that. But let's identify who this elect is. Well, first, Isaiah 45, 4 says, Israel, mine elect. But let's look at the last phrase of Matthew 24, 31. Go back to Matthew 24, th verse 31. I'm sorry to make you turn here so much. I assure you, this is going to be the last time you turn to Matthew 24, 31. We're done after this one. I want you to look at the verse. I shouldn't say I promise, but uh, let's take that one. I had my fingers crossed when I said it, but uh, I'm just playing. But hopefully this will be the last time. This, this is the last point I'm making right here. I assure you that. that is, this is the last point. He says that he, they're gonna, these angels are going to gather together his elect, watch this, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So this elect is coming from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That identifies who the elect is. Because the elect is from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Okay? Uh, go with me, please, to Zechariah. Zechariah. Next to the last book in the Old Testament. Find Matthew. Go back two books. You run into Zechariah. And go to Zechariah chapter 2. In Zechariah 2, in the first part of the chapter, the context here is Jerusalem. The, the Jewish people, even afterwards, it's, it's about Israel, it's about the Jewish people. But look what the Bible says about the, the Hebrew people in Zechariah 2, verse number 6. Look at Zechariah 2, verse 6. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. Watch this. 
For I have spread you abroad, talking about Israel now, as the what? The four winds of the heaven. That sounds like Matthew 24, 31, didn't it? That's what that sounds like. Oh, we're not done. Go to Ezekiel 37. Go to Ezekiel 37, back to the left. Ezekiel 37, we're going, we're going to actually go back a few more times. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. Start, let's start verse number 1. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Y'all know what this is already, the valley of dry bones. And caused me to pass by them, round about, behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said to me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews of the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covering them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the what? The four winds. O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I, prophet, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they um, lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of what? That sounds like the elect. Behold, they say our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy, say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Uh, if he's going to bring them into the land and these four winds are going to blow upon, that they're going to come from the four winds, that sounds like the gathering of Israel, doesn't it? So Israel might elect the gathering. They, they were scattered to the four winds. Now he's saying come from the four winds and come to the land. That's what he said, come to the land. Now, in the millennial reign, there's going to be countries all over the planet. This group is coming to the land. That's Israel. For the four weeks. And I'm not done. Go to Luke 21. Luke 21, real quickly. As fast as your little fingers can flip. Luke 21. Verse 20. Well, I'm not going to read all these, but ver start at verse 20. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, okay? Jesus is prophesying of the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in 70 A.D. So the temple has been destroyed. The city has been destroyed. Jews have been destroyed. In fact, I was listening to a guy teach the other day. He was talking about how in that day, Christians were leaving Jerusalem and the Jews were running to Jerusalem all at the same time. Because the Christians believed what Jesus said in Luke 21. When you see the armies come past, then run. The Christians listened to what Jesus said and were running away from Jerusalem. And the church historian Eusebius said, it's not none of one Christian that died in that war between the Romans and the Jews. Because the Christians listened to Jesus and got out. The Jews were running to Jerusalem for safety and they got killed. They didn't listen to Jesus. Jesus is prophesying that time. Look what the Bible says in verse 24. And they, Jesus said, the Israelites shall fall by the edge of the sword. That's exactly what happened. They should be led captive into what? All nations. So the, the, the Jews end up spreading throughout the whole world. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down the Gentiles till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So because of the wrath of God upon that people, they were spread throughout all the world. So there's Jews all over the planet today, okay? Spread all over the planet. Go to Deuteronomy 28. They were not scattered like the, you know, the church has been scattered. Uh, the, church, but the church has not been scattered because we backslid. We've been scattered because Jesus said, go into all the world. We, we were scattered because of what was right. The Jews were scattered because they were wrong. Go to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Look at verse 63. 
Deuteronomy 28, verse 63. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you, talking about the Hebrew people, He rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and you shall be plucked from off the land. Do you see that? Whether thou goest to possess it. Does this sound like, tell me, does this sound like Luke 21 as we read this? They're going to be scattered into all the nations. And the Lord shall scatter thee from among the people, from one end of the earth even done to the other. Boy, that sounds like Matthew 24, 31. And there thou shalt serve other gods, that's what they're doing today, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone, that's what the Judaism is idolatrous today. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease. They've never found a, they've never found a home place. Everywhere they went, it's been trouble. Some things they call, some things racism calls. But regardless, they've never found a place. Neither, they're not even at home in their home right now. Israel right now is in turmoil. And the Bible says, uh, Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee a trembling heart, there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, sorrow of mind. Thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and thou shalt have none assurance of thy life. Even sitting there where they're at, they don't know if the Palestinians are going to bomb them, or Iraq's going to bomb them, or Iran, whoever it is. Somebody's going to bomb them. They, just, they don't know. And then no assurance of life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even, and at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning for the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. That's exactly what Jesus prophesied. He's just tagging on to what Moses said here. Look at chapter 30, verse number 1. Chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations. When you're scattered, you'll call them to mind where the Lord thy God hath driven thee. And thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. Thou and thy children with all thy heart, with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. I'm not going to read all the rest of these verses that sounds like the regathering of Israel, doesn't it? I'm going to gather you from all the nations. He scattered them to the four winds, Matthew 24, 31, but I'm going to bring you back from the four winds, and I'm going to bring you into the land. In fact, one more, one more verse, I'm done, Isaiah 27. We looked at this a little bit ago. I'm wrapping it up, this last passage, Isaiah 27. Matthew 24, 31 is different than 1 Thessalonians 4 because, as I've shown you, the elect, the gathering of the people there, those are Jews. Those are Jews that have been scattered. They were scattered because of their sin. Now they're being gathered together because of the salvation of Christ. They're gathered together from all nations at the end of the tribulation period. Look at uh, Isaiah 27. He talks about how they're gathered. Now how, how are you and I gathered? We're caught up. As one unit, as one bride, we're caught up. Look at verse 12 of Isaiah 27. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river and the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one. Y'all see that? When he gathers Israel, he sends his angels. This angel, you go get that one. That angel, you go get that one. That angel, you go get that one. That angel, you go get that one. One by one. From the four winds of the heaven. When he comes to get the church, he comes himself. We all go up. When he comes for Israel, he sends the angels. You go get that one, one by one. Do y'all see the differences? That's why Matthew 24, 31 is not our rapture. It's very similar, but it's different. So it cannot be the same. It's one of the reasons why I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for letting us study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.